ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ and we're we're off to the races this is part yeah. three of the 47 part ken mcquarry trilogy <laughs> because this may take longer than anybody can uh, understand trying to understand trying to get to the bottom of ken mcquarry and his fabulous buffalo line model railroad i was ken i was telling so let me introduce everybody because uh, ken i've had a podcast reviewed a few years ago and the guy says the one thing you do is you don't introduce anybody and i'm like well i know them what difference does it mean <laughs> <laughs> so we have our buddy rich the whiz wisniski good evening good evening we have ken mcquarry uh what what town do you live in ken uh, mailing address is Downingtown, Pennsylvania, but I actually consider I live in Eagle, Pennsylvania. Eagle, Pennsylvania. Wow. Mm. That's almost as cool as Mustang, Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, then we have a new fella here because I discovered when I was, uh, visiting with, uh, Doug and Rich and, uh, Uncle Dave over there at the old Crest and the Station Inn in Crescent, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, that Doug has operated on your layout like over a hundred times. Oh, yeah. Yep. Is he any good at it? Oh, yeah. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello, uh, Doug. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and then finally, because we couldn't find anybody else to fill the fifth seat. <laughs> <laughs> the regular, the regular of all the regulars in the AML Nation is the modeler simply known as Kelly. Hello. Yeah. Right. Doug, have you ever heard of the modeler simply known as Kelly? I don't believe I have. Now, I'm assuming you've listened to all the podcasts and some of them twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Are we scaring him, Rich? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I know Doug has listened to at least some of the podcasts. Oh, has yeah. he? Oh, oh yes. he's probably been in the car while you're listening to it. Is that? Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's forced to listen to it, yeah. And Rich Seems... listens to them all. Like I always yeah. feel like I feel like now when I'm doing them, I gotta. Rich will be listening to it on the when it comes out, or within a day or two of when it comes out. So I better make this good. <laughs> I, well, I did listen to the one that was released just recently, where you mentioned being in Crescent and uh, chatting with myself and Doug and and with my son Andrew. Who were we talking to, Rich? I think you were part of the conversation. We were standing on the porch. Ralph uh, Heiss was with us, and you were there, and we were talking about operating on uh, Harold Worthwine's layout when you operated there. And I was asking Ralph how come he's been operating forever and ever and ever. Uh, Kelly, you would love Ralph Heiss. Rich, and I said, you know what would be a great podcast is you and Ralph, and there was somebody, a third person, and I can't remember who it was. Uh, I believe it was Doug Watts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you were, you've operated, been operating for years as well, right, Doug? Correct. And you are, we'll introduce you to everybody. You are, you live in somewhere in New Jersey? No, I'm in Gilbertsville, Pennsylvania. So I'm between Philadelphia and Reading. Oh, okay. And what's your home address? What's your home phone number? <laughs> just in case. Five, 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 one, two, one, two. There yeah. you go. Yeah. yeah. Just in case anybody wants to get a hold of you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and you worked you start you are uh, you were a you were a retired full-time railroader, right? Yes, that is correct. And you wow. started with Conrail. Right. And whenever whenever uh, our buddy Uncle Dave mentions you and Conrail, he starts to get the sweats. He was start <laughs> Doug, Doug worked for Conrail, you know. Yeah, yeah, Dave, I know you told me a hundred times. <laughs> Like he's, he was there. He was there when it was happening. Yeah. I know Dave. Try to relax. Um, <laughs> would, so Doug, would you be part of that uh, podcast if it was you and Rich and Ralph Heiss? 
Oh, talking about operating on Heralds? No, talking about operating on all the layouts you guys have operated on, because between you, Rich, and, and Ralph, you guys have operated on just about every layout within 100 miles of, or 200 miles of New York City, Philadelphia, all those places. You guys have m- operated everywhere. Yeah, we've uh, we've been fortunate. Yeah. So would you be on that podcast? Sure. Because it'd be the same. It'll still cost you the $230. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you take pay, you take PayPal, right? Yeah. Did we fail to mention that to Ken? Checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I don't know if I could just throw out one other little tidbit here. Doug, um, Doug was at one time building a layout. I don't believe he is now, and I think he sold off some of his track. And who who might you have sold that track to, Doug, in the Reading area? Oh, that was um, that was Tom Jacobs. Oh, yeah? Oh, yep. Oh, cool. Now, how do you know Tom? Just, you know, him t- through model railroading kind of thing? Yes. Right. And then, uh, when he was starting his construction, uh, supplies were tight, and I was selling track and other components, and we were talking, and he said, oh, man, what do you have? And I told him, he said, you know, let's make a deal. So we did. So how wow. come you stopped building your railroad? Well, I, I have the opportunity to to regularly operate on a number of layouts as we started talking about earlier in the conversation here. And I have a buddy of mine who is uh, underway uh, with construction on his layout. So I decided that it's quite a project uh, that I really don't want to manage right now. So I'm going to continue to operate and get behind the construction of this gentleman's layout and, uh, you know, let the chips fall where they may. But yeah, I had wanted to build a layout, had a concept, you know, had a track plan, um, but it's not going to happen. Okay. (laughs) But now, but you, you like Rich, have all these layouts that your regular operators on. Correct. So, so, I mean, that's, Rich will claim that he's not a model railroader. And I will claim that he, in fact, is a model railroader because he partakes in numerous operating sessions and he's quite good at it. And he's very heavily involved in Uncle Dave's layout. So I, I, I contend that Rich, the Wiz Wisniski, is, in fact, a full-blown model railroader. Mm-hmm. I don't think you have to build a layout or build no, anything to, to be. No, a, you don't. Yeah. Um, I, I accept the nomination. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Kelly. Yes, sir. We're going to give you, we're going to give you a try at this. Oh, and, geez. And then uh, what you need to know is that Rich is in the bullpen ready to come out. If you start good, if you start getting in trouble. Because, Doug, have you ever – don't answer this question just yet, Doug. <laughs> but, uh, but Kelly, you know what? I bet you, what? Doug, I bet you Doug has used Rapido Trains. You're a fast track to model railroad fun. Rapido Trains, you're a fast track to model railroad fun. Nice job. I don't know if you yeah. know this. Uh, what is that? I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I insist. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> On the next fans, I'm telling I'm telling everybody about our texting conversation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like talking I to still a, I still haven't found that piece of paper. It's like talking to a rubber wall, I'm telling you. I know. But I love you, Kelly. I know you do. I know you um, do. so uh so Doug, have you ever used Rapido trains? Yes. Oh boy. Um, all right. Enough about Doug. I know you want this entire show to be about you. <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> I know it is. I know it's fine with you. <laughs> I know not, not only, you know, who was I talking to? I was interviewing somebody the other day. Oh, a fella named uh, Chris Palmieri. He was in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And he has this business called Home Shops. Shops. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he sells cars of freelanced model railroads. And he's doing quite well. He's been doing it now for about two and a half years. And it's really flourishing. And what he does is he goes like, Tangent will be making a particular car. And he'll order X number of them, a, a large quantity of them, but have them painted in a prototype or a freelance prototype railroad uh, scheme. And sells them, and they're doing really well. So then I said to him, "Well, you got to talk to Ken McQuarrie." And he said, "And you know what he said? Who's Ken? that? Yeah, that's exactly what he said." 
and I went, you don't know who Ken McQuarrie is? And I said, well, he's kind of a, and then I, we talked and I said, when I thought about it, I thought, well, he is kind of a secret. I mean, he's not somebody that's, it's not like the Franklin in South Manchester where you've been uh, in the magazines constantly or like you really, do you, like how many, uh, the, their layout hasn't been in the magazine that much, has it? Uh, the first time it was in the magazine was in Real Model Journal. That was right, probably probably towards the end of 93. And it's been in uh, MR twice. Uh, the first time it was in, there was a picture of the E units. Going, uh, that was when I was in the Pensy era. E units going past the blast furnaces, and they said it was the world's largest home model ad or something like that. And I said, oh, no. You know, I saw that. But uh, I figured it'd be pictures of that on people's dartboards. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, the second time was, I guess, the first time I ever saw uh, pictures of Penn Central locomotives on the front of model railroaders. And then the last time was in RMC. Uh, that was in December 22. And that's when they did uh, Steve Mallory's and mine. We both modeled basically the same section of the Penn C, different eras and he models a, a chunk of what I model, but uh, it was sort of a comparison piece. So, do you remember uh, in the late '90s? I think it was in the late '90s. There was a great article in Model Railroader about the Pittsburgh Model Railroad Club. They're in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, just north of Pittsburgh. They own the building and everything. And they had there was a great picture of two of uh, some F units, you know, um, on the cover, and they were Pensy F units. I'm pretty sure maybe they weren't. I should find out. I should find out from the guy who took the picture, that which was me, of course, and wrote the yeah. article. Oh no, I don't remember. Now I'd have to run out to the hallway to see if. Well, now forget it. Just see, see how well we're prepared, Doug. Yep. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were pens of units. I might have to take a break and go run out there and see. Um. So why were you bothered that they said it was the world's largest home model railroad? Well, it it may be it may be one in the maybe the top ten or something like that. I mean, I know of other railroads out there. It depends on how you model, you know, how you measure things: square footage, amount of track, number of levels. Uh, you know, I know there's a couple out there over four thousand square feet. Mine's thirty one hundred and twenty, but most of the other ones are usually a single deck or maybe you know a double deck. And mine's mostly a double deck, but there are a couple of places where there's five decks. So, uh, uh, you know, and <laughs> even though I got all this room, people say, you know, well, why do you have, you had all this room? Why did you build all these decks? And I said, because I needed to. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, the Buffalo line is 300 miles long, real, real world. Mine is about 1,400 feet from Enola to Buffalo, to Mineral Springs Yard in Buffalo. And, uh. But, you know, I, I model a lot of the uh, the branches that come off, and a lot of those branches have their own level. So that's where the other levels come in. Mm -hmm. so, and some, uh, of the, some of the levels you added after the main portion of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I added, you know, I added uh, the lower level. Uh, the original east end of the railroad was what I used to call a knoll, and it was a, basically a big six-track loop. Uh, each each loop could hold two forty car trains in it, front to back, and uh, and then I uh, when I, I put the addition on the building, I guess it was in ninety seven or ninety eight. I decided, well, I'm going to build a, a hump yard over here on this lower level. So I did that. I called it Harrisburg, but what that did was it added more east west traffic along with the traffic on the Buffalo line. So I really needed more east end staging. So. Uh, I decided to uh, model uh, an interlocking, which I just call uh, simply called Rockville, and basically it's a, a double track line that goes into a Nola staging, and then there's a double track line that goes into a helix that I build in place underneath an existing railroad. And how, did, uh, how the hell did you do that? Uh, well, I was young and stupid at the time, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I measured between the two levels. I under, I got up underneath and I looked at the bench work and I said, okay, this will fit. So what I did was I just started it and laid the, the bottom in and worked my way up. And then once I got close enough, uh, 
I made like U-shaped supports that came off the bench work up top that would, or actually L-shaped uh, supports that held up the helix. And then once I got to a certain point, then I went ahead and just sort of cut the hole in the middle of the bench work and connected it to the, to the, what then was the, the basically the original level one. So, uh, yeah. Aren't, aren't there some parts like over around, like when you come up the stairs, you turn left and you work your way around the back and mm -hmm. rich, rich and Doug, feel free to fill in here. Cause I'm not, and you work your way around the back and there's some levels that seem like they're really wide. Like, yeah, there are. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, a lot of areas, you know, it depends on what you're going to do with it. You know, how much operation is in that area. If you don't have to worry about reaching in and getting things, you know, throwing turnouts or uncoupling cars, sometimes I'll build them up to three feet wide. But some of them, you know, some of my areas, like on Keating Summit, it's really only about 16 inches wide. So uh, it varies. It sort of, you know, I don't want to hide the lower levels to a point where it's a really a pain in the butt to get to them. So I've done that in a couple spots, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are some areas up top like where Buffalo is on uh, like the East end of the steel plant, uh, where the bench works actually in one area, almost nine feet deep. And, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a, a scrap areas in there. And there's also an area that was called the drop and the drop, uh, existed in real, uh, in Bethlehem, what it was, it was basically a big area that had uh, concrete, really thick concrete pad, a big crane, and they had an iron ball, and the iron ball weighed about 15 tons. And what they would do is they would bring things in there that needed to be broken up into scrap, and they would drop the ball on it. And it would, you know, it, it would destroy, they brought our old army tanks in there and broke them up. And, uh, yeah, so that, but that is actually located on top of a hatch. So now you have, in order to get to there, you have to crawl underneath the layout. You come up in the middle of the helix that runs uh, on the bald eagle branch. And then you just sort of lift up the hatch and the whole drop goes up in the air and you can get the stuff in the back. But that's how I build it. But, uh, so but I really, yeah. I was just going to say, so here's my problem, Doug. With it, we've done two two full uh, episodes. This is the third episode with uh, with Ken, and here's my problem. Here's one of the things that this is why Ken and I are going to have come to words eventually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how did this guy design this massive layout, and like I, you know, it's like how do you come up with an idea like this? And one of the things you said to me when we were at Crescent, Pennsylvania, at the Station Inn. Stationinpa.com, I believe. Is that right, Rich? That's correct. All right. Go to go to stationinpa.com and uh, book a room. You'll never be disappointed. Alex Slang owns it, and tell him Lionel sent you, and see how that see if that helps. Um, Doug. So when you and I were talking, I discovered that you saw his layout at the townhouse. Yes. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's been very evasive about how he planned this uh, railroad, and I've been I've been trying <laughs> I've been trying to figure it out. So, Doug, can you give us a as a visitor to the townhouse? Can you give us a rough idea of what that was like? Yeah, that was. Um, I was there. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ken. I was there for the last official session in the townhouse, mm -hmm. and what the what I recall from the townhouse was it was a a small version of what Ken has now. Yes. And there was, and the, the thing to me that was really cool is there was a lot of operation in a small footprint, but it was not jammed into that footprint. Um, you could get around, of course you didn't have the aisle space that we have now, but you could get around and you could follow your trains and you, you could do things. And it was a smaller version of, of what Ken has now. Like, like small as in what was the overall, like, was it the whole basement kind of thing? Yes. And it was, it was 16 by 32. Is your name Doug? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if you haven't noticed by now, Doug, I'm kind of a smart ass, but I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming you've already picked that up. Yeah. I kind of picked that up. Okay. <laughs> So how did you get invited to the townhouse? Uh, let's see. You got invited to the townhouse <clears throat> uh, via a, 
a Monday night round robin group uh, that I had gotten invited to. And it was comprised, uh, interestingly enough, uh, a number of the members of that group were Conrail employees that and we all worked in Philadelphia. And I met Ken at one of the Monday night groups. He had a session coming up and he said, hey, so if you'd like to come, you know, come on over. So I did. And uh, after the, the last session, then I uh, got invited to help take that layout apart. Um, so it was, a, it was a pretty interesting adventure to go for the last official session, then participate in dismantling that layout and then helping to build the new layout. Oh, so you've helped to build the new layout. Yeah, I was now I was not part of the uh there was a there was a team that was there all the time getting things done. I was part of a team that used to come over on Wednesday nights. Uh so that was my that was my time to be there. But I remember Ken for one of our Monday night groups, Ken took us to the building before anything and I'm sure you remember this, Ken. You took us upstairs and I mean it was just amazing to see this this space with nothing in it. And I mean it was just it was huge. And um, then to see where we are now, it's it's been a pretty amazing journey for me um, to see all the things that I've been able to see and participate in what I've been able to participate in. So we're talking uh, we're talking thirty years basically. Have you been there pretty much at least once every year for the last thirty years? Like you've been an ongoing regular participant? Yeah, the only time that I missed was the uh, the eight years that I was down in Fort Worth. But I mean, it, occasionally I was still able to come back. Well, I was able to come back and help with some guest operating sessions. But yeah, I, I couldn't make it back for regular sessions. Okay, wow. cool. So and so you got invited because you were a Conrail employee. Uh, uh, Uncle Dave's listening to this and getting the sweats again. Every time you mention <laughs> every time you mention Conrail employee, Doug, Uncle Dave gets the sweats. Isn't that right, Rich? You've seen it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He, gets very, he gets very excited, and we all know how excited Dave, Uncle Dave can get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you, so, uh, so this would have been the early 90s. Can you give us a, a slight indication about how it's changed to be a full-time one-to-one railroader and be a model railroader? Because I get the indication that 30 years ago, you really didn't talk about it. But nowadays, it's like much more mainstream among railroaders is that is that a true statement I, I would say i would agree with you on part of that but i will tell you this that my first interview at conrail i was asked that question i was asked if, yeah i was asked if i was a rail fan and what the way i answered it was that i was a rail historian uh interested in photography and documenting uh rail operations and you know i because and i I figured out I'm going to be honest because this was something I had wanted. I had I started my work career in the petroleum industry and I worked for Sun Oil Company for 11 years uh, in various departments. And I had this opportunity to interview a Conrail and I thought I've wanted this for a long time. So I'm going to put my cards on the table. And I'm going to be honest because if I lie about this later on, if it comes out, then it's like, well, we can't trust this person because he wasn't honest. So I, I put it out there and I figured if it blew up in the interview, then it wasn't meant to be but it didn't blow up in the interview. So that is cool. Um, and Rich, how did you, I know you've told us already, but let's review just quickly. How did you end up at Ken's? Ken visited the Onondaga cutoff. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes. I remember now. Yes. He visited the Onondaga cutoff. He didn't operate. He refused to operate because uh, <laughs> uncle Dave wouldn't, because he wasn't a former Conrail employee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> uh, but 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 Ken made, made the offer that day and then i think it was through jim dalberg and um jim kerner that i finally was able to make the connection and actually come down and and go to my first session and is that where you met doug no i had met doug previously doug makes the rounds Right. And uh, comes up to North Jersey for several sessions. So I, I'd be hard pressed to point to exactly when I first met Doug. I don't know if you remember, Doug, but. Yep. Yeah. It was at uh, Ted Pamperin's CNO Railway New River Sub. That's, okay. a, that's a spectacular model railroad. We've got to figure out how to get him on the podcast. So, Ken, I got a question for you. I got other questions that I wanted to ask you, but I want to ask you this one because we're kind of on the subject. Did, uh -huh. Do you ever get the feeling, like, do you get a lot of. Do you get any satisfaction or do you get a lot of satisfaction from the fact that you've brought so many folks together over the years 
and you've probably created friendships and you've probably created uh, uh what do you call it a uh, network of people that have where you're the you know because of your layout i think it's i think it's a main street uh, it's a, a unique thing to model railroading you know like everybody knows i ride a harley i love to do that but you don't nobody else is riding my harley and i don't ride anybody else's and yeah. you know yeah. and it's it, like where where model railroading is exactly the opposite it's like you build this thing and please come and use it so do you do you get a sense do you understand like you know, all the friendships and relationships you've probably helped create. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I look back, I mean, I, for the longest time, you know, I was a lone wolf. I didn't, you know, I knew some people are into trains, but very few. And, uh, a friend of mine, uh, decided he was more into cars, but he was also, he liked Lionel. So he decided he was going to open a store in a uh, farmer's market. And so I, I went down there to help him and odds and, and I knew some you know things about HO and everything else. And he had this flyer there and it was like, it was for open houses. And, uh, I said, ah, oh, this is okay. So I, so I grabbed one of the flyers and, uh, one of the open houses, uh, was at, uh, guy name of Carl Huth who lived down in Delaware. And, uh, so I went down there an open house. And I was there and just walking around talking to people and, you know, they didn't know me. And I, it was, it was an end skill layout. And the interesting thing I was sitting there talking and I was talking to was one guy I was talking with and turned out it was John LaShawn who Doug knows or Doug knew. I mean, John's passed away since, but, uh, John, you know, worked for Conroe and worked for Penn central. And he said, Oh, where are you from? And I said, well, at that point I was living up in Frazier at the townhouse. He says, oh, I have a friend that lives up that way. He says, his name is Bob Davis. And he gave me his name. He'll give him a call. He says, you know, okay. So I gave Bob Davis a call. And Bob Davis is one of the guys, that, uh, the Conrail employees that was in the Monday night group. And uh, so I went to, you know, I, I, I went to, I guess the first session I went to was one at Bob's house. Then I went to one at uh, Jim Dahlberg's. And then I went to one at uh, uh, Jack Chester's. And like uh, you know, uh, everybody, I was the only at that point. I was the only non-Conrail employee there. And it's you know, what are you going to model? Well, I think I'm going to model the you know the Buffalo line. And all of a sudden, I had all this information. You know, mm. uh, it was like you know all the stuff. You know, you, as a non railroad it's like you know, you know, I I saw a train. I know it's a train on the Buffalo line, but I have no idea. You know, what, what where are that where were those cars going? And yeah, you know, so all of a sudden, I had that connection. So I started operating and then, you know, uh, when I started operating at Charlie Karangi's, that was another, Oh, you got to go see this railroad in an open house. And I met there, I met Doug Clay and then Doug Clay, he modeled the Lehigh Valley. And then I'm not, you know, uh, I mean, you, you just meet these people in my, the spread of the, the roots of my model railroading kept getting wider and wider and wider. I knew more and more people. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, st I still go to Jim Dahlberg's every so often. Bob Davis now lives out in, in Wyoming, but we, you know, we still do talk left and right. In fact, I just, I had a question. I said, I want to model some traffic at a McGee carpet at, at Bloomsburg on the x Erie Lackawanna. And I said, what, you know, where did, where was it going? And, you know, what kind of cars did they use? And he said, oh, well, it's, you know, 86 foot four door cars, uh, probably some EL, uh, you know, and most of them are going to Baltimore. So, you know, there's something there I can, you know, I mean, I have a call a friend of mine in Wyoming and I can find out what traffic came out of McGee's carpet in Bloomsburg on the, on the area of Lackawanna. So, uh, and you know, I have, I say I have 54 people when I sent out my, you know, I'm going to have an operating session. There's 54 people on that list. And then a lot of them have friends. And if I'm short people, a lot of guys, you know, can only make it every so often. And, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, well now I got 34 people. Well, I'll, you know, have some two man crews. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it, it becomes a gathering place. It's sort of like, you know, like, you know, I guess you just say that like, you know, the hobby shops used to be people get in there and, Oh, this guy has a model railroad. Yeah. You know, so they're gone. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's, I make, I try and make the railroad accessible. You know, a lot of people, Oh, you don't want to see anybody. I said, no, if you want to come see the railroad, come see the railroad. You know, I mean, a lot, a lot of them just want to bring their kids to see a bunch of trains. Yeah, and, I, think, I think that's something we got to make sure we get the point across, uh, is, uh, you and I never really met. We met once 20 years ago, briefly. And then we had the opportunity to meet at Tomstock 
when you opened mm-hmm. your layout. And I got to tell you, you know, you're the kind of guy that really makes me glad I'm in model railroading. But you're, you're an, ex- you know, what I've learned from these three uh, podcasts is you're an extremely welcoming guy, and you you love people, and you love uh, having people partake in your railroad. And I think people should know that for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. I mean, when I you know when I, I recently when I when we operate, I've been doing the Alt- we have a sort of an Altoona operator. I so you handle the bold eagle branch and you handle two stagings and you know you get calls from like a dispatcher downstairs and this guy's coming or i got this guy coming out but i it's there are down times when i can sort of stand there and watch things going on and you know things are quiet i can walk around and it's sort of really neat to you know stand there and you're watching a train you know it's coming out of renovo with helpers on the rear end there's a guy coming down with helpers on the back for braking yeah, you look over there and they're over the on the West Branch Valley on the ex New York Central. There's a guy working the Needham Breaker. And then, oh, okay, the Mineral Springs Yard, there's a guy who's classifying cars, and here comes a hot metal. And it's like, I said, this is really neat. I said, and, and part of it is like, damn, this all came out of my head. You know, so, <laughs> but, but you, you know, basically, it was stuff that I thought up to, or took, you know, real world stuff and you modify it. And I go, like, and these people are having fun doing this. It's, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes I think a lot of people take it really too seriously. I mean, it's still, to me, it's, I keep telling people, I says, no, I says, it's a bunch of grown men playing with more expensive toy trains. And you know, I tell, said somebody else, I says, you know, the amount, amount of paperwork and everything else you got to do. I says, imagine, it's amazing the amount of stuff we do just so we can run some trains. You know, it's, but, uh, but it's, it adds the enjoyment to it. And uh, especially when you meet somebody, you know, like uh, Steve Mallory, when he's here, he, he usually, he usually likes to run road crew because yeah you know, he does he dispatches at his and you know when you own a layout you you're the you're the management and when you want to go to somebody else's layout usually you don't want to be management I just want to be one of the minions you know and run a train from A to B and B to A or wherever else and he that's what he wants to do he run yeah you know, and then he gives me you know ideas or he says this this where it works that need or this needs to you you this I think this would work better which you know, I take people's advice so. Well, and I, I'll just jump in here and say, and Steve, of course, for those that don't know, Steve Mallory is retired from a career as a train dispatcher for Conrail and then later Norfolk Southern. So I, I suppose he's dispatched enough trains in his life that he doesn't need to do it on the model yeah. layout as well. And you know what, you know what just happened, Rich, when you were saying that Steve was a dispatcher for uh, Conrail? <laughs> Uncle Dave's getting all sweaty again. <laughs> oh god <laughs> um uh, this is great uh so uh before we carry on oh hey and you know what and all through the years kelly he's every time he goes to operate a model railroad he's always enjoying rapido trains you're <laughs> I was Uh-oh. laughing. I was <laughs> laughing. <laughs> nice job. Uh, nice. Oh, I know. I, You're fast track to model rowing fun. If it's M, if it's H O, the fast track is Rapido. <laughs> <laughs> does Jason keep track of these? I yes. think he does. I think every yeah. time uh, I think every time Kelly screws one up, he it's, it's, yep. it's, he puts a mark on the wall and says that's another one and it's like you know, he's like, uh, he's going to come to me one day and go, you know what? This isn't working as well as I was hoping because <laughs> of Kelly. Um, all right. I got this. So, uh, uh, Ken, after this, this is not your last time here, by the way. Um, oh, I want to, we're going to have to do at least one more episode because we're going to have to let people from who are in the AML nation, uh, we're going to have to let them ask questions. So we'll questions, put something yeah. on our Facebook page, which I know okay. you regularly attend. Uh, the fans of the AML and uh, we'll put a, something out there and we'll let everybody else ask questions. But I got a bunch of questions. Uh, some of them uh, you've already answered. Um, did you, ex- so what was the original size? What's the original size square footage of the original barn before you put on the addition? Okay. The original barn uh, inside dimensions were 31 by 79. How many, and uh, how many square yeah, no feet? windows there- there's there's one fire door on one wall, which I just put in there because I thought it would be a good idea to have a way to get out. And then you have the stairs coming up. So that's really the only, uh, you know, the so nice how, thing about it, there's no plumbing up there. You know, it's. Yeah, yeah. So how many square feet was that? 
Uh, I don't know. Let me see something here. Yeah. Hang on. Do Let's some see. do some ciphering. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it, it, and it gets into his... 2,449. Okay, and now with the, the addition, it's like 3,200 square feet. Uh, Yeah, it's actually, it's 3,120 square feet is what it is right now. So. You said you know somebody with a 4,000 square foot home? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, there was, uh, oh, there's, I know there's a UP layout there that's a monster, and there's another one out there, I can't remember what it is, it was in one of the magazines. Uh, but it was, you know, I mean, it, the house, it must be a huge ranch house because it was, you know, it was a basement layout. So, um, okay. So when you added, you were explaining to us on the last episode, on our last episode, when Ken was explaining to us, uh, on the last episode, you were talking about Keating Summit. So did you, ex and you were talking about how the, how the, the helper grade wasn't long enough. Yes. So did yep. you did you primarily expand the railroad strictly to get a longer grade for Keating Summit? Uh yes, I did. That was really that was that and I also had an idea. Uh the idea was to lessen the amount of reset that needed to be done between sessions. And you know, the original layout, you came down through Seals Grove and the next interlocking you hit. Uh, basically it was what I, I called it Rockville, but at that point, the lower, the lower level wasn't in, and there was a six track loop. And the, the issue with that was, and it's underneath, you know, the levels above it. So in order to reset that between operating sessions, you had to bring everything out to where you could get to it. And then you got the car cards and you, you know, you went through the car cards and reset them. And then you basically had a whole bunch of guys running around pulling cars out of trains to build new trains and it took a lot of time. And you also get car handling. And if you start buying any of the newer cars that have all these great little detail parts on them, uh, you start to discover that they're not meant to be picked up and, you know, picked up, moved around, put back on the track numerous times. Uh, so I said, that has got to be a better way. And I said, well, I could put the, I could put this addition out here. I could go out, I could, uh, it's going to be 32 feet wide, actually 31 inside, the same as the rest of the barn, but it basically turns the barn into an L. And I figured well, I can go out 24 feet, so the inside would be about 23 and a half, because all the, up, the walls up there are all two by six studs for extra insulation, keep the heating and cooling costs down. And I figured, well, what am I going to, what else am I going to put in here? I knew, I knew where Keating was going to go, so I said, well, I could. I, I'll put this other peninsula in here, and, the, and and I'll make I'll make it a yard. I know, but I'll make it a yard. And uh, so I did that. And actually, I had a, a sixteen track cla a class hump yard. And I had uh, it, I I called it Harrisburg because it wasn't really a NOLA. And my eastern staging then, rather than becoming just the a NOLA, sort of became everywhere else, which was you know. East, you know, be Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Pot Yard, Hagerstown, whatever you wanted it to be. And I said, okay, so the Buffalo Line trains will come down here and they'll terminate in this yard. And then the yard crews, you know, during the operating session, they'll take this train and they'll run it over the hump. And what it did was it took a, say, if I had a car that, say, went from Buffalo to Baltimore on the previous layout, Baltimore was just the east end staging, it was everything. In the new, the new world, when I had the yard, it would go into the yard, and then it would actually be, it would come out of the yard as a train to Baltimore. <clears throat> okay. It gets, now it gets in staging. And the nice thing about it now is, okay, it's in Baltimore. Well, it's going to come back to Harrisburg. So all you had to do was mark the cards, change the header, didn't have to touch any of the trains, and it would come back in. It would go in, go over the hump. And then they would make up a buffalo. And so a lot of the in-between session work was handled during the session. So because because the because of the expansion, you had the room to do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's I mean, I, if you build a really large model railroad, especially one that has long runs, uh, you know, when people think people people all oh, they want, I want more run, I want more run. I said, well, the issue is if you put a crew on a train in my world in Nola and say, okay, you're taking this train to Mineral Springs Yards in Buffalo, and let's just say this train has no work. So, you know, it basically takes off out of staging and it gets usually to Renovo. It's heavy enough. 
We'll put some helpers on the back and you'll push it up over Keating. It comes down off of Keating. You take the helpers off and it runs to Buffalo. Well, now that guy's been on that train for a minimum of an hour, maybe an hour and 20 minutes, maybe an hour and 30 minutes. If you're going to run a four hour session, a crew's only going to be able to handle two trains. Which, and, which is pretty cool. Which is cool. But if you want to run a bunch of traffic, that means you got to start throwing more crews at it. And the more crews you throw at it, then the dispatch you can drive the dispatchers nuts. And then you also discover about yard time versus main line running time. And yard time is slower. And uh, so it, it's there's a it's a limiting factor. You ought to so, write a, you ought to write a book about operations. No, I'm serious. The way you're describing all this, and because this happens and that happens, I mean. You know, it's the model railroader's dream is because you have the layout of the size that you do. You probably mm-hmm. do have the biggest home layout going because of all the levels and track trackage and all that. Let's remind everybody, your actual trackage is about a quarter of a mile long. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's 1,420 <laughs> feet exactly from, you know, basically midpoint of the Enola loops on the lower level to, to a Mineral Springs yard in Buffalo. So, um, uh. You know what, Ken? I got to tell you, I had a really crappy day at the hospital today, and okay. I, and I'm really in, I was looking forward to this all day, and you guys have not disappointed. Uh, Good. Uh, Good. Um, so I got now I got uh, kind of questions. I'm going to go deviate first for a minute. So okay, uh, Rich and Doug, because you guys operate so much, and you've operated so much on Ken's layout. Like, do you notice with the new stuff that it has so many bits and pieces? Like, is that like a pain in the butt when you're operating as much as you do? Like, do you find that you'd prefer like the stuff hadn't advanced as far as it had? If if that's make if that does that question make any sense? You, you mean as as far as the the quality of the locomotives and rolling stock? Yeah, like I mean nowadays the the stuff is beautiful. The stuff that Rapido trains. You're fast track to model railroading fun. <laughs> That one you sounded like you were ill or something. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Trying. Don't forget, Kelly. I know you got a bunch. I know you got a bunch of questions, so you get your chance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sorry, Doug. This is being your first time. I really apologize. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me come back to the equipment real uh, we'll, we'll put a pin in that. I want to go back to something that you had talked with Ken about writing a book. Uh, on one of the Wednesday nights when I used to come over uh, a number of years ago, Ken was working on uh, reblocking trains. And he had a big whiteboard at the top of the stairs. And so when I came in, you, you come up the st- central staircase. And he had all of these uh, classifications, and it was he had numbers against them. You know how many Anolas, Conways, etc. And so I started laughing. He goes, "What's so funny?" I said, "I said that's what I was working on today uh, at work." I said, "We went through, and Conroe had a schedule book, and it was in a white binder, and so it was called the white book." And we had gone through with the senior vice president of operations. We had representatives from different departments, and we were going through the white book train symbol by train symbol to talk about simplification, uh, increasing efficiencies, et cetera. And when I came Wednesday night, here's Ken doing the same thing that we were doing. And I thought he's doing it for model rarity. And I've told Ken this many times that with the, the transportation system that he has, it would be a great teaching tool Mm. for folks that have not had uh, field experience at the railroad. Like when we're talking about, maintaining block integrity on a train and how you work a train when it's making set outs and pickups. And and he looked at me and says, what do you mean? And so we went over to Renova and I I gave Ken my example. I said, we should bring people here so they could see this. I said, because we can keep talking about it until you illustrate it. Some people won't get it. Um, So it's, it's been great for me to, to do the, the crossover between prototype and model and his railroad lends itself to that uh, very well. Uh, going back to the equipment, yeah, with the with the advance of equipment that we see now, both uh, motive power and rolling stock, I always try to be very careful if I'm handling anybody's equipment um, because of the 
the great detail, uh, the number of parts that can come off. And it's been interesting to have conversations with, with layout owners and other modelers when we talk about having a blend of equipment. They said, well, are you just displaying these or you do you have an operating railroad? So I have an operating railroad. And so I said, well, I'm going I'm to do a blend. Hey, I'm still running some blue box atheron cars as stand-ins and fill-ins, but then there's going to be other cars there that are in that consist of that train. And if I have a blue box, you know, if it's nicely weathered, hey, it's in the train. Maybe somebody notices, maybe they don't. So I always try to be respectful of the equipment, no matter what it is, but especially with what we have now and especially with the price points that that uh, that, that equipment commands. And, and do you find like you're kind of like, I don't want to touch that because it's such a, you know, finely detailed model. Like you kind of, are you like when you reach for the Athern blue box car, it's like, you know, you know, you're not going to, you don't want to, obviously we don't want to damage anybody's equipment, but you know, you're not nearly as leery of knocking off a something or other as you are with maybe a brand new tangent car or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Lionel, what I find myself trying to do is, is be situationally aware of, of the equipment. Um, and I mean, I've operated some places where the owners say, even if there's a derailment, please do not touch anything. I will come take care of that. Not a problem. Um, hands off. And then I have other, other folks, like when I'm at Ken's, it's not a problem. If you, Ken knows and he knows who he can trust and, and, you know, who's going to respect the equipment. Uh, so he's never said that. And, you know, we'll take care of re-railing trains, et cetera. So and not that there's, you know, a lot that has to be re-railed on Ken's railroad. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, that's the impression I get about Ken is like, it's like, uh, have at it boys, you know, like, uh, you know, my layout, if somebody knocked a car over or something like that, I was like, that's just part of you having people use the stuff. So, uh, Rich, what do you, where do you stand on the, the spectacular new equipment and, and handling it? Does it kind of give you the heebie jeebies or? Um, so, so I, I mean, I don't, I find it a rare like Ken's or, or at the Onondaga cutoff, you know, there's certain railroads where there's always track power. Like you don't have hesitation where you feel the need to like push a locomotive. Well, okay. Long. Yeah. I've been to other railroads. Harold's was a, Harold Worthwine's Erie was a classic example in part because of the old control system used there where, um, you were always struggling and you're always ended up having to kind of push things along a little bit. Um, and as a result, you know, you were handling them a lot more. That doesn't happen often at Kent's. So the other thing about the newer equipment I'll, I'll throw in is um, I like to operate with Y throttle. Um, and that really allows you to play with the features that some of the more advanced decoders have. Uh, I don't know, the dynamic brakes or uh, um, uncoupling sounds. What, what, you know, all that stuff is if people have that programmed in, uh, you can actually make use of those functions. Otherwise, you're just randomly hitting F numbers and you don't know what you're going to break. So you just don't do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the fun things about the OC and the Y throttle is a throttle that you use off right off your smartphone. And it's really, really cool. I really, really like doing it because when I'm not operating a train, I can watch Russian car crash videos. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do both at the same time. Otherwise your train will stop. Exactly. <laughs> so Ken, what's your secret? To keeping the railroad running so smoothly, a size a railroad that's, that is thirty two hundred square feet with a with a quarter mile long, fourteen hundred foot long, uh, one to one main line. What's your secret to keeping the running the railroad running so well? Uh, well, when I built it, the vast majority of the railroad is Code one hundred because that's what that's what was available and. You know, readily available, I should say, back when I built the majority of it. Some of the newer areas in Buffalo are 83. Uh, but, you know, Code 100 track and Pico turnouts, uh, very few issues with them. Uh, I have uh, tortoise machines. I have some of the Hanks Crest machines and the Ricks racks. Uh, it, I just got, it's funny, one of the uh, guys over in New Jersey just recently had an issue where he had the uh, the Rick's racks. They had a little paddle that the motor drove back drove back and forth. And trouble was it was soft plastic. So after about you know probably two hundred cycles, the thing would split in half. And uh, yeah, and I and I saw that and I said, yeah, I discovered that after about a couple of years that I was repairing them. So I would make up spares and you know drill them out and and sort of eliminate the paddle. 
But the idea was, it was uh, yeah, I'm going to go up there and just start replacing these from end to end because eventually they're going to fail. Uh, just a lot of things, you know, lo locomotive wheels, uh, you know, when you had the Atherns, you get you put Northwest Short Line solid nickel silver wheels on them. You don't put the plated ones on because the plating wears off. Okay. Uh, That's a good like tip. That. You ought to write a book, buddy. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I use you know KD couplers. I get rid of all the plastic couplers. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you put a, a, a car on the railroad, you you know you run it, you make sure the coupler height's right, you make sure they go in because we do use magnets, so I make sure that that's right. Uh, the other thing I do have too is uh, uh, I actually have a shop cycle, and on the old cars, actually, it was one of the there's eight eight rows of uh, uh, destinations, and one of them would say shop. And the idea was it would go into a shop track at a yard. And then in between sessions, you'd go through and you'd pull the car up and you'd, you'd clean the wheels. You check the couplers, uh, glue back on any detail parts that fell off. Usually, re usually replacing stirrup steps seemed to be the most, most common thing. And then you'd mark on the back of the card, shop this today. And then you mark and it would go to its next thing. So the idea was you sort of had preventative maintenance bit by bit. Uh, the latest thing I'm going to use now, actually, is I had a building up in uh, I have a building up in uh, Buffalo uh, that's going to become uh, uh, the uh, T.J. Weber. Uh, T.J. Weber. Uh, he he was. Uh, uh, can't think of the name. What was the name of his company, Doug? I can't remember his name right. The name. Oh, it's Oli Oli um... Oli Oli Valley Car Shops. Yeah, yeah. And he may actually made. You know, he three D printed at Pensy. G38 uh, or Jenny. And uh, uh, he was 21 and he passed away. We, we lost TJ. So I decided to rename the building after him. And what I'm going to do is once a session, uh, I'll start a train in Northumberland and I'll tell Northumberland, make a shop train up. Just pick 10 cars, any 10 cars at random, put the cards in it, it stops at Williamsport, it'll pick a couple up, it'll go up or set them out. And then in between sessions, I'll go through the cars. And you know, if, uh, yeah, if, yeah, and like the unit trains I have, they, they, they run, you know, they, they, they run, the only thing I do with them is pull loads out, put loads in. So once a year, I always go to a unit train and I'll, you know, clean the wheels and check everything on them and mark on the back of the, of the, of the, of the a header card for that train. Okay. Car, train has been shopped this date. And, uh, I actually had a list somewhere around here where I said, you know, okay, this month, this train, this train, and this train need to be shopped. So, uh, um, yeah. so now you say, guy, I pick ten cars, but doesn't that screw up your? Of course, it's car cards. So you just—that's the beauty. Yeah. Of, that's the beauty of car cards. When yeah. you arrive at a town, you right. do what the car cards say. So if the train, if the car is not there, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't screw. Yeah, I'll, I'll just tell. I'll I'll tell Tony Regowski, who does the classification in North Arm. I'll say, Tony, I says, just pick ten cars or fifteen cars at random. I said, you know, makes no mind me. He said, just pick them and then make up a train and tell them it's a shop train. Right. And yeah. and yeah, and all it does it goes up. And then when, when it's shopped, the train turns around and comes back down to Northumberland, and then the cars just re-enter the flow again. Right, yeah. Oh, what a great idea. So, you ought to write a book. <laughs> or I ought to write a book about you. Yeah, you could do there, that. There you go. That's what we need, yeah. uh, Rich, is uh, to write a book. Uh, Kelly, now you have a series of questions. <laughs> you don't have any questions are you i'm i'm listening i'm just fascinated i just i can't it's just so uh doug i don't think we really described to you kelly lives in uh medford <laughs> oregon and he is the president of every model railroad club within 102 miles of medford oregon that's not many <laughs> <laughs> and he's also the chairman of the board of the medford railroad park uh board of directors um, oh, okay not the, chair not the chairman you're not the chairman no, no, I'm a member. Well, I thought you were, or you're on the board. I'm on the board. But you're gonna do that. You're gonna be the. You right, were the chairman. Point, yeah. You were it's the chairman. A year, maybe two years from now. Right, and you're gonna be the chairman of the board again. I don't know if I'm still if I'm still there. Yeah. Can you do New York, New York? Start spreading the news. I'm leaving today. I want to be a part of it in New York, New York. 
<laughs> well, do you at least have blue eyes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Nice, have blue eyes. nice. Yes. Out of boy, Rich. Yeah. yeah nice one. Um. Uh. Okay. So I got a question for you. So uh, on our last episode, when we last le- last left our heroes, we were about we were talking about uh, Rich getting a chance to run the bomber. And then he mm-hmm. told me that there was like an operating session between the, these two episodes that we recorded. So did you get to run the bomber, Rich? So the the operating session was postponed. Oh, oh, yes. oh. Why did you postpone it, Ken? Uh, I was short about four or five people. And there were people that I really couldn't. It was uh, I had no helper crews. Uh, and a couple, you know, there are certain people that I really need to have, and there's certain jobs you really just can't say, "Here, I want you to push trains up over Keating Summit," because uh, unless you know what you're doing, it's you're asking for trouble. So uh, there's a magic number that I have to have, and I was just short of that magic number. Why didn't so. you call me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my! It went goodness. to voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Uh, you are so funny. Uh, what, man, what are you going to ask? We have got to make your... All right, so are you opposed to having your layout more publicized or more well-known? Is that something you're concerned about? Or is it just something that you were never... It never really mattered to you? So, like, I mean, you know, when you think about it, over the years, some railroads are very famous be, well, uh, because they've been in the model railroad press so much, whereas yours which is spectacular beyond spectacular has never really been in the model railroad press very much. And is that, is that a conscious decision or it's just that you really don't care one way or the other? I don't really care one way or the other. I mean, it's <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I built it at, you know, what's up there it came out of my head. I built it cause I wanted to build it and I found a bunch of people who want to come and operate with me. Mm. So it's, you know, that's right. Uh, yeah. That's, so now uh, going back to this bomber thing, Doug. Now, uh, what do you do on the railroad there, Doug? Um, I've done a little bit of everything, uh, Lionel. I started way back when at uh, with another uh, two other guys uh, at Renova, and I was one of the, the uh, early helper crews. Uh, then when the railroad expanded, uh, Renova became it morphed into more operations than just helpers on and helpers off. Uh, so eventually I became the yard master uh, at Renova and I had a responsibility there. Then over time, as operations have changed, uh, I've moved back out into the field and uh, gotten requalified on the railroad. And so there's a, a couple of locals that I've been operating out of Northumberland. So I've, I've done a little bit of everything uh, as Ken has asked me to and has allowed me to qualify on a lot of different jobs. Do you actually have to get qualified on these jobs? Uh, I would say, yeah, just like what what Ken talked about with uh, with helper operations, and I know from our conversation in Crescent, you've had helper operations on your layout. And there's people that think that, and you know, this isn't being a smarty pants or anything, but there's people that think they can do it, but they can't because you really have to pay attention to what's happening with the train, and because of the size of the trains and the the curvature and degree of grade. Um, you have in-train dynamics, just like with real trains, uh, and people have to pay attention to that. And some people, they're too busy rail fanning instead of paying <laughs> attention to what they're doing. Um, and, and we have problems. So okay. we, we had a qualified group of very small group of, of helper engineers that, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll say we took pride and take pride in what we're doing. Um, and I remember the first time we did one of the ore trains. And we said to Ken, um, hey, can we do mid-trains? And Ken kind of looked the other way and said, all right, if you guys think you know what you're doing. So so we did it. We had mid-trains and we had helpers on the rear. And it was funny because a bunch of people were following that train. And I was, I forget if I was on the rear or if I had the mid-trains. I was actually sweating on that run because so many people were watching what was going on. And I said, man, I don't want to jack this up because, you know, I'll, I'll get banished from here and won't be able to ever come back. <laughs> but uh, it, wor- it worked out well. And uh, Ken trusted us enough to let us do it. And uh, I've, I've always appreciated that. So. so do you know what the bomber job is? Yes. Do you think uh, Rich is qualified to do it? Absolutely. 
because we were trying to make we were we we're making a push on the last podcast to get him to uh, get a, give him a chance to do the bomber job. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, I've never done it, but I've talked to enough crews that have, and it's everybody always talks about how much they enjoy being on that local job. So now, Rich, are you prepared to put your foot forward there and get your stick your nose in and get uh, write down your name for that bomber job when next at the next operating session that you go to? I'm prepared to do whatever I can do to help Ken's layout work better. <laughs> and if it's running that train, so be it. Yep. <laughs> the, ne the next session we run, that Rich is here, he's going to be on the bomber. All right. Now we're getting right. somewhere. We I, have, go. I have spoken. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> he has spoken. He who controls it. So here's something our buddy Uncle Dave uh, has said, which I really actually think was a cool thing when he said it. And I'm interested in your uh, observation on this, Mr. McQuarrie. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, he, Dave said one night, one time when we were talking to him, he said uh, he thinks that building an operating model railroad is a noble enterprise because it introduces so many people to model railroad operations. And uh, what do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I, it is. It's, yeah, I mean, you, a lot of people will build a railroad and they, you know, cause they want to run trains around and around and around and around until they get bored and say, okay, I'm going to tear this down and I'm going to build another one. And they tear that one down. They build another one. And they run it around and around and around and around and until they get bored and either they quit or they build another one. And I said, now the idea is you, start, you build a railroad just to mimic what the real world does. You can't duplicate, you can mimic. And, uh, I said, you know, it, it, and the nice thing is it, it's like a different path because if you decide to, say, pick, you know, a prototype railroad versus your own, uh, you know, you can actually say, okay, I'm going to model, you know, I'm going to model the Buffalo line. I'm going to model from Enola to Williamsport, and I'm going to model, uh, I, I like Penn Central, so it's going to be Penn Central. So you start off and you just run, you know, you, you figure out, you can sort of find out what the, the uh, train symbols are, and you start doing that, and then bit by bit, you can find out more and more about it. So it, the interest level can go for years and years and years. You just don't, it's, you know, you don't know everything right away and bit by bit, you can make adjustments. So you, you don't waste time tearing things down and money and you build something and it has a long life. You know, like, I mean, uh, you know, mine upstairs is, you know, it'll be, it'll be uh, 31 years old. It's 31 years old right now. And uh, we had, you know, a friend of mine, Doug Clay, he modeled the Lehigh Valley. And, you know, that railroad was about 30 years old when it went away. You know, so, uh, you know, a lot of these railroads have very long lives, which means, and, you know, but they've been modified and things have changed over the years. But it's still the same basic railroad, which means there's not a lot of wasted time, effort and money, you know, uh, just, you know, thrown to the wind. And. And and also it, it shows people, you know, I mean, to what to what length do you want to get into operations? Some people, you just want to dip your toe in the water. Do you want to put your foot in? You want to go into your knee, or you want to dive off the board and go in all the way? You know, it. Yeah, that's you know when you, you when people see what you've done, and they go, oh my god, you know, and they're looking at something that's been running for twenty years. Well, there's twenty years of changes and learning in that and you're not going to pick it up right away so it, it can be very intimidating to people i would think so. uh, uh i would think now we talked about a little bit about it before but i mean you know some people come by and i bet you they i love how i love what you said about you know how guys will come to the railroad uh you'll exp they'll get it all they'll have it all explained to them and then as they're going out the door they pull a string in the the bo and the bottom of the pants all the information falls out oh yeah yeah <laughs> every, every time they show up, it's a brand new experience. You know, it's oh, like, yeah. oh, I, have I been here before? Uh, yeah, last week. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, and that's the kind of person you don't want to hand the bomber to. You yeah, know? There you go. All right. There you go. Um, so, some people just get it. I mean, you know. It's, yeah. So, yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's not that complicated. And if you think, I always say, if you think of it like the game of Monopoly, if you don't play Monopoly by the rules, nobody's going to have any fun. So, I mean, operating a model railroad is simply understanding the rules and following the rules set out by the layout owner. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, depending upon how, 
complicated you make the rules can determine on who wants to come back too. I mean, you know, you say, yeah. well, yeah. I mean, a lot of people now, you like they, they got, a lot of guys go nuts with way bills. They, they well, I, I need these, I need the operator to know what's in the car. And I say, no, you don't. No. I mean, you know, is it tank car? Okay. Well, is it hazardous? Yes or no. That's all I care about. I don't care if it's got LP gas in it. It could have, you know, dirty water in it. I don't care. But it's like, you know, well, this car has to go to here and it has to be set this side and it has to have two cars in front of it and two cars at the rear. And the guy says, how do you know all this stuff? You know, and right there, you probably lost a potential operator. You know, it's uh, the more complicated you make it, the more you scare people off sometimes. So, right. uh, so this just in from the head office. The uh, Pittsburgh Model Railroad Club was featured in the August 2000 edition of Model Railroader. And on the cover was two Western Maryland F units. So you were right. There was the, there was a great article that written, uh, t- photographed and written, very well photographed and very well written. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I visited that. I think there was an NMRA convention out there, late 90s, I think it was, or something. But I, I remember we visited that club. It was nice. Um, very nice. Have you been to a uh, particular? Have you been to a particular uh, home layout or or club layout? I guess that kind of blew your socks off and and inspired you to do something major on your own railroad. Uh yeah, yeah. Charlie Caranges was probably the one that did the initial thing. I mean, I built, I designed the the townhouse layout originally was designed because I was an N scale at that time, so it was designed to be an N scale layout. And I went to Charlie's and I and Charlie's was a multi-deck layout. And the first time I ever saw a multi-deck layout, I said, oh, wow. So I came back and designed this railroad was for a 16 by 32 foot basement. We went through the stairs. We knocked holes in the stairs, run tracks through the stairs. And, uh, but before it actually got built to that point, I actually switched from N scale to HO. So I did that. So we had this really nice railroad, but it had no staging at all. None. It just went from A to B and then it was a big loop. Then I started operating on Charlie's and I discovered things about staging yards, which was a destination. And like Charlie uh, went as far south on the corridor. The model Pennsylvania railroad, basically 1952, the south end was pot yard and Washington Union Station. And the north end was uh, uh, was Wilmington. And then there was also the port road that went off at Perryville, and that ended up in Harrisburg, which also allowed you to send trains west uh, of Harrisburg to Altoona and you know, Chicago, St. Louis, and stuff like that. And you decide, oh, okay, so what am I going to do with this? So, oh, I know what I'm going to do. So I took the main line that used to go to the staging track or a storage track of sorts, and I actually cut down through the middle of the peninsula, and I made it go down a grade, and I actually hung a staging underneath the middle peninsula and so you know all of a sudden now i had staging and in the north end i said i need some i need staging in the north end so i put staging in the north end i had a branch to sort of stop i said well i want to model past this point so i hung up another level on a wall so you know going to charlie's you know i discovered about multi-decks and that changed that and then i discovered about staging and then also, you know, his was, his was the first railroad I really operated on. And that it was a big change. So it was like, oh, this is sort of cool. You know, the car cards that I used were, were basically designed by Charlie, uh, probably back in the middle, middle 70s. And, uh, you know, I've used it ever since. So, um, uh, um, uh, Doug, I have a question. Doug and Rich, I have the same question for both of you. This time okay. we'll let Rich go first. Uh, how, when did you start operating there uh, at the uh, uh, Buffalo Line, Rich? I believe it was 2016. So not that long ago, really, eh? Seven years. Yeah. It's all relative. Yeah. What, was, what did you think the first time you walked? What did you think the first time you went to operate that layout? I mean, when you were driving home, <laughs> I mean, the first time you walked <laughs> up the stairs. What did you, what was your, like, what was your, what did your brain do the first time you walked up the stairs? Because by this time you've been operating uh, model railroads for quite a few years and you've seen all sorts of model railroads. Uh, had you even heard of Ken's before, before you met him? Oh, yes. Yeah. I okay. don't know 
how I knew of it, but I definitely knew of it, knew it was in a barn. Okay. Um, I think, interestingly, one of the things, and maybe this is more of a personality issue of mine than anything else, but one of the things that I walked up those stairs at uh, 545 and you know, saw 30 guys hanging around waiting for the, uh, for the pep talk from Ken, and I only knew like three of them. Like it was, that was very intimidating to me, you know, not because anybody was being bad. It's just, I'm not good in a crowd that I don't know. And it's, it's funny cause I've been down there seven years and there's still people there that I don't really, really know, but I've gotten to know most of the folks. Um, but then you start walking around and you, you know, you, you go around this one corner and you keep going and then there's another corner and you go around another corner and then you start to look at the levels. Like it's, you can't take it all in at once. You've no. been there. No, it's, it's impossible to take it all in. Yeah. But I mean, go in there for the first time for your first operating session. I mean, that's a great description of, you know, you th- knew three guys out of 30. So, I mean, right out of the box, you probably felt pretty intimidated about not screwing up. Yes, but Ken assigned me, uh, I want to say, I think it was Wayne Betty was uh, who took me around the first time. Um. And, uh, you know, an experienced operator there. And right. it's been, uh, you know, onward and upward since then. So has, has uh, so this is probably a better question for you, Doug. What in the 30 years, like what is kind of, what have you noticed that's been the, has there been the changes that you've noticed that you kind of, you know, mark history as it wa- marks, wa- marches through history? Like are there moments at at the Buffalo line where you're thinking, you can kind of remember like in 2003, this changed or that changed or whatever, like or has there kind of, do you remember it in stages kind of thing? Oh yeah, definitely. The, uh, the addition, when the addition was put on the building, um, and that definitely altered operations. Um, since I spent a lot of time at Renova, the, how that morphed into more than just helpers on helpers off. I mean, we dispatched the locals from there. At one time, there was an extensive passenger train operation where there was through trains that set out cars that became passenger trains that originated at Renova and then vice versa. Um, there's always road trains that would work there. So it's, 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 been, it's been interesting to see the evolution and, and how things have changed. Uh, areas that Ken has added to the railroad, areas that are scenic that weren't. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's, it's been, oh, and then, the, then the, the changes in eras, um, uh, Penn Central, Pensy, Penn Central, Conrail, and then back. And as I said to Ken, coming up that central staircase, you get up there and you're watching the trains, uh, go up grade. And I said, it's like, I'm driving West on us 22 on the way to Crescent. And I'm looking over and I see the trains coming because especially when he was doing Conrail, and I said, man, it's just like I'm on 22 and I'm in the car and I'm looking over and say, hey, there we go. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been neat to see the, the changes. Um, also, ch- you know, changes in personnel. Uh, we've got some folks that have been there for since day one and people that have come in and out, uh, you know, for various reasons. Um, let's get into this whole changing of the era thing. I mean, Ken, I was OK that you built a gigantic model railroad. I'm OK that you added levels. I'm okay that you added an addition and to make it 3,200 square feet. But what is it with you and this changing eras thing? Like, uh, did you, <laughs> do you just like, did you, what, do you wake up bolt upright one every once in a while and go, I don't like this anymore. I'm changing the era. Uh, yeah. How's <laughs> <laughs> uh, that for a simple answer? Uh, no, I mean, you know, when I first built it, it was what I call late pensy which was like 62 to 68. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I sort of discovered, you know, everybody used to hate Penn central and cause it, you know, killed the Penn it killed the New York central, whatever you think. But you look at it and operationally and model railroad wise, it's like, this is really pretty cool because they didn't have the money to buy a whole bunch of new stuff. They bought some, but they kept running the old stuff. And so it's like, Oh, it's really interesting. So, you know, the Penn central came about. And I ran that, and bit by bit, was more and more Penn Central stuff. And then, you know, with you know, and Doug and Bob Davis and you know, Jack Chester, these guys, that, and that, and I was out doing some rail fanning. And, you know, out with Bob Davis, we'd go out and shoot train. i shoot videos of stuff, a lot of stuff. Basically, when I was living at the townhouse, I did a lot of this. 
And uh, so it's like, oh, she's well, Conroe's really pretty cool. So next, you know, you know, well, I'm going to I'm going to model, you know, late Penn, C, uh, late Penn Central and Conroe. And I never went any further than about really about 81 or 82. That's as far as I've ever gone. But, uh, you know, it was Conrail when uh, 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 Keller did his tape on the Buffalo line. Uh, I was modeling Conrail. And so he was, if you happen to look at that tape, it goes, oh, well, where'd that stuff go? He says, well, I decided after a while it was fun. And I just pulled some of the Penn Central stuff out. And by that time, a lot of the Pensy stuff that I had to kit bash, uh, you know, back then, it was available. So. I'd sell old stuff off and buy you know, new stuff and replace it or, or kit bash stuff. Uh, so it's been, you know, the late Penn C, Penn Central twice. And uh, it was uh, steam when Broadway Limited did their steamers, the M1s and the I1s and the L1s, uh, which is really what the power was on the Buffalo line. That sort of brought about the 56, 57 era. And every one of these eras last about five to seven years. And that seems to be when something in my brain kicks off and says, okay, it's time to change something. Uh, the nice thing is the Rara doesn't change. You know, Renovo is always Renovo. Uh, you know, there, sometimes there'll be the uh, train symbols could change. And, uh, but, but, you know, many, so many, you, many, you know, what? Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ah, all right. Someday, many, someday, someday, Ken, when this per, uh, podcast is like professional. You'll really, uh -huh. we'll have you back and we'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been doing it for like nine and a half years and I'm still no good at it. Um, yes, you are. Uh, so, so you, you, you change an era and uh -huh. like how many locomotives are on the railroad now? Roughly. Uh, probably 150. So when you change an era, you have to change 150 locomotives? No. No, no. I mean, a lot, what it is like a lot of the Penn Central locomotives. I, right now, I'm modeling 1976 to 1982, uh, the Northern Central Railway, which is my own railroad. Uh, a lot of people that model, you know, freelance or fictitious, they'll say, "Well, you know, this is, uh, you know, there's a track between A and B here, and you know, this is the way it, it should have gone, and it didn't go, or something else." I said, "No, you know." When I, I, I uh, for a number of years, I had a, a Fairmont speeder and I got into that where I was riding a speeder on a lot of the speeder trips for Narcoa. And that actually, over the years, I actually owned two high rail trucks. I actually owned an X80, X Conrail uh, GMC Suburban and it painted yellow. I restored it and I would take it on trips. And then one time I built a, a 99 Suburban. The nice thing is, is I got to run on almost all the branch lines that I model upstairs. Right, and, right, right now, Uncle Dave is having having convulsions when you said you owned a Conrail high rail truck. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, like, he, it's like he can't. He's just like he's having all kinds of like he's having a complete sweat sweat fest. <laughs> yeah, it was it was actually Ed Secours, the division engineer out of Altoona. That was his truck, <laughs> and B seventy one twenty X for anybody that wants to know what the real number was. So, so okay, uh, so you so you change eras and. Yeah. Uh, now, now you've led me to another question. You know how some people are like, uh, this railroad is October fourteenth, uh, nineteen, you know, sixty-five or mm -hmm. nineteen seventy-eight. Blah blah blah. At you know three three o seven p.m. in the afternoon, and you and you model like a five or six year span, right? And like, how, like, it, I'm interested in your take on basically proto freelancing or modeling a railroad that like you when you have a span like explain to me and explain to the world this is a really how am i doing with this question kelly i think you're doing really well <laughs> i don't even know what the question is yet i know uh, um explain to me if you can and explain to the world how you manage to because some people would be like well, you can't run that because, you know, that didn't run in 1980. It ran in 1977. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do you justify, like, uh, explain to the world how you justify or what, what is your reasoning? Not justify. Justify is the wrong word. Help me out here, Rich. I need a better word. It's not justify, but how do you, how do you find it in your head to enjoy that you have a six-year span instead of a, 
30 day span, let's say? Uh, it doesn't, I mean, 70, 76 allows me the first days of Conrail, which means that I could have uh, unpatched Redding, Erie, Lackawanna, Lehigh Valley equipment running around. By 82, everything had been patched. Probably by about 80 or 81, the last Penn Central stuff was pet. So, I mean, I can, you know, the nice thing is, is the Penn Central stuff that I have uh, and some of the writing stuff that I have, I can use that. It just gets, it's, it becomes, a, you know, I don't change the numbers. I, I will, I will, to some equipment, I will patch them. You know, I'll take them, I'll weather them, paint over, over top of the previous owner, stick the Conrail number on it. And, you know, it's what I remember seeing. Uh but it doesn't bother me. It's like, no, this is, you know, this was my idea. This is my world. Uh, have fun with it. If you don't like it, keep it to yourself. You know, uh, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I have you know, transfers that come out of Anola that go to Nori. And I can have, uh, you know, I, because I have catenary on part of the layout that didn't really have it. But that's because I grew up next to it. Uh, you know, I can have E33s bring a transfer into Nori out of Anola. Or I can have a GG, GG1s bring one up. And, you know, GG1s only lasted on Conrail till the late 79, maybe early 80. So, uh, you know, it's like, well, that, you know, that wouldn't be up there. I said, well, it is on mine. You know, it's, uh, you know, I sort of stop at 82. I mean, I don't have any Conrail quality on the on the railroad. I never really liked that scheme. I thought it was a good for a special scheme. But to use to put it on every piece of equipment, I thought was sort of a diluting the fact. So, uh, uh, that was from somebody who you know managed a fleet of a, a, a fleet of fifty eight trucks at one time in my life. Yeah. So uh, you know, if you had a special one, it was a special one, but you didn't do the whole fleet as a special. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, yeah, right. It's funny. We're sitting right here on my test track in front of me. There is a uh, yeah, X E L S D P forty five sitting here, which is in Conrail Blue, and right behind it is a Siggy six thirty. Uh, X Penn Central Alco that's been painted out. It says CR on it. It's got a CR number on it. So it's, yeah, and that had run before. So it, it's not like I'm getting rid of all these locomotives and buying new ones and everything else. Uh, yeah. But you, and, yeah, some some stuff yeah. gets some stuff gets sold, but not all of it. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so uh, Doug, how do you enjoy the the era changes as an operator, or do you enjoy them? Would you Would you rather he stayed with one era over the years? Oh yeah, I mean, if it, if it was up to me, it would have been uh, it would have stayed Conrail. But uh, it it's been neat to see it's been neat to see the transition. Uh, there are some operational changes, but for me, uh, I like motive power and rolling stock, and I l like looking at details on equipment and and different types of equipment. So that's been interesting to see the changes in uh, the types of cars as far as size, and then also something that I think maybe some of us haven't thought about the color um pensy you know the, the the palette was all pretty much the same uh with a few exceptions you start getting into the other eras and then the, the the color there's more of a rainbow of color uh, of equipment yeah dealing with that i mean when penn central came about when the first green box cars and green cabin cars showed up man it when i still when i you know decided oh, i'm gonna do some penn central up here they stuck out like a sore thumb but it was neat yeah. And the same thing when I decided to do Conrail and all you had seen, you know, through the trees was either, you know, Brunswick green or, or black. And all of a sudden there's this bright blue locomotive. It's like, wow, that really, st that looks neat. You know, it's, uh, so how come after all these years, you finally decided to do your own, what do you call it? What's the name of the railroad? Nor the Northern Central Railway. So what, what uh, was it that all of a sudden made you decide to create your auto, your own proto freelance railroad? Uh, I always liked the V&O and the Utah Belt. And, you know, I was like, and th th to me, those were believable freelance railroads. Uh, it, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, this, well, this, this is Chicago and this is Los Angeles and this is New York, you know, on a five by 10, <laughs> uh, you know, even, you know, even upstairs, like, oh, no, I said, oh, I'm still going to model exactly what I modeled is the Buffalo line and, and seeing what has happened to the real Buffalo line since 99 when conrail went away uh yeah i mean now norfolk southern really only runs as far as driftwood and which is you know a little bit past renovo and there isn't much 
And then from there on up, it's the western New York and Pennsylvania and the north end up near Buffalo. It's the Buffalo and Pittsburgh. A lot of the branch lines still exist, but, uh, uh, you know, Andy Mower's Redding and Northern run some of the Redding side. You have the uh, Cedacog Railroads, the North Shore. Uh, yeah. So I said, OK, well, I'm going to just say when Conrail came about that the steel plant, you know, my corporation uh, wanted to you know, get into the into the railroad business. So we decided to, you know, buy the uh, the Buffalo line. And, uh, and I, I looked at it as a business, so to speak, what made sense. And, uh, yeah, would it really happen? Probably not. But, uh, in my world, yeah, I mean, basically we, 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 you know, we haul, we go away to Buffalo. We have helpers. A lot of the operations are really the same as they were when Conrail had them. Conrail does have tractor rights over sections of the railroad. So there's still Conrail trains, but, uh, vast majority, almost all the locals and such are all Northern Central Railway. So, um, and you've never been to, and yet you've never been to Buffalo. Nope. You've never, never been, I, and you've never been to wing nuts in Buffalo, which is like, make some of the best, uh, wings going. No, um, nope. Never, never been there. I got it. So. You got to come to Buffalo and I got to take you to wing nuts. That's what we got to okay. do. Okay. Well, we there can you. do that. Yeah. Um, so how many locomotives do you have painted now for the, what did you call it again? Northern Central Railway. Northern Central Railway. I yeah, should probably I, write that down, eh, Rich? Uh, there's right now. There's probably <laughs> about forty or fifty that I've done. Uh, some of them, there's there's two different paint schemes. The original paint scheme uh, was uh, dark, uh, basically Brunswick green or dark green locomotive enamel. So what I did actually is I took some of my original Pensy units and uh, I basically converted them to Northern Central. And uh, uh, I always liked the Wisconsin Central and their scheme. So I used to, I buy the microscale decals for Wisconsin Central and I would use pieces of it, the striping and the nose stripes, and basically redo a Pensy engine with a new number series, all based on horsepower. Hmm. And I did that for a while. And then I, then I got into the, yeah, I wonder what Conrail Blue and UP Yellow would look like. So I came up with that scheme. And I did some locomotives in that scheme, some F units and some other odds and ends. And uh, then I decided, let me try a, a simplified scheme and uh, runs it green again and did that. And that's the one that seems to have one out recently. So uh, so there's different schemes, but you know, most of the some of you know, the most of the cabin cars are uh, 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 some of them are blue and yellow and some of them are green and yellow. Well, that, and that's that's kind of one of the problems that's all, that was uh, happened to me with my railroad. One of the problems with a proto freelance railroad is you go, oh, you know, I kind of wouldn't mind. Like mine started out as green and yellow, and mm -hmm. then it went to black, and then it went all green, and blah blah blah. And it's kind of like uh, different paint schemes. Actually, I did an article about that that was also on the cover of Model Railroader, and different paint schemes. But that's kind of a cool thing because a lot of railroads did that. They did change paint schemes. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. I, can, I have another question that we can't let go until okay. we the, until the next episode when I'm we're gonna let the we're gonna let the masses send in their questions and you'll have mm -hmm. to ask them. Okay. How about you, Kelly? Uh, go yeah. go one, ahead. One thing I say about paint schemes, though, it's funny. I uh, uh, Atlas did uh, a high nose C four twenty for MTA, and they they were blue and yellow. And I looked and I said, "Damn, that that pretty much matches." So I, I bought one. And I said, well, I wonder if I, I change this and I'll change that. And I said, that really looks nice. I like that. So I, I made it a Northern Central. And uh, I talked to a couple guys at hobby shops. Well, it turns out they were having trouble getting rid of these locomotives because not too many people, people model, excuse, actually, the Long Island Railroad. And uh, so, you know, I have, I have a bunch of them now that are, uh, I have uh, non-dynamic brake. I had equipped C four twenties in local service, almost out of Northumberland and out of uh, Buffalo. That's <laughs> that's kind of a good idea, actually. You go to a hobby yeah. shop and find out what doesn't sell and use it for you. Use it to be to be the stuff that can be repainted. Kelly, yeah, are, you'd be, yeah. Kelly, are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, so, uh, Ken, have you ever repeat uh, uh, repainted or painted <laughs> any? 
What are you doing? You know, if you start laughing, you can't do it right. I can't help it. Uh, no, uh, I right. have never. Right, I've hang never on, read... hang on, hang on, hang on. Rich, are you ready? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. All right. Uh, have you ever re- repainted Rapido Train? Your fast track for model railroading fun. <laughs> I just love it. But you were starting to say Rapido and you changed it to repaint. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never have, but I have renumbered some. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, wow. So, um, all right. We got to talk about this uh, locomotive you got in the, in the oh, main floor yeah. of, the, of the garage, <laughs> of, the, of the barn. Oh, the cab. Okay. Yeah. The SD45. Yeah, so, yeah, it's like, yeah, you say it like, you say it, and they're, they're, on the first episode, we were talking about all these locomotives that you own with some other guys, and it's like you were talking, telling yeah. me so fast about it, it's like, my head was spinning, because I just did yeah. a, I just did an interview, that I think we've already published it, that uh, we did publish it already, because this is like, this is probably in October that we're talking, that we're listening to this, um, that we're, uh, our buddy Otto Vondrak went to Scranton because Doyle McCormick and his PA were uh, being delivered to the uh, Genesee Valley Transportation Company. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was thinking of you when we were talking about it because you're a guy that has uh, involved in a bunch of full-size one-to-one r- uh, locomotives. But enough of that. Tell us about this locomotive you have in your uh, barn. Okay. Uh a number of years ago at an NMRA convention, there was a company called PI Engineering that was at one of the train shows. And they make, uh, you ever seen those little, they have a little desktop controller you can use to, to run your train or actually uh, when they had what the train simulation things, uh, it worked with that. Well, they had a little trailer parked there and inside this little trailer was a full size control stand. And there was a, a flat screen in front of you and a flat screen on the side. And you sat there and you could run a simulation using this control stand. It was a standard AAR you know, control stand. And I was, this is really cool. And I asked the guy, I says, could you use this to, you know, run a model train? He says, yeah, I guess you could. I said, oh, okay. So I, I grabbed the brochure and uh, I guess about two months later, I, I gave them a call and I said, Hey, I says, uh, what do you think about this idea? I says, yeah, well, that would happen. I said, all right. right now, I said, all right, I'll tell you what. He says, you know, I'll send you a deposit. I want to buy a control stand from you. And he said, okay. And then I guess it was about a couple months later, I got this, you know, okay, we're going to ship your control stand. So the, this big, huge, uh, you know, fiber is actually, can't, they actually make their own fiberglass box to hold this thing. It, it's a full-size fiberglass rep, you know, rep, replica of an AR control stand. Uh, it's got all the gauges in it. It's got... Uh, Basically, what would be like 26 brake handles in it, Thro- eight, you know, eight, eight position throttle. Uh, it's got the sanders. It's got the bell, horn, everything else. And it had their own electronics inside with a couple of USBs to plug into the outside world. And I said, oh, that's cool. So I got it in here and I originally was going to put it, I uh, have an area where the crew lounge is. And there was an area where there was a Lyco dispatcher originally before I moved it to the barn. I said, well, this would be perfect. I can build half of a cab. And I run it to build much. I, I could put a you know, fake windshield in the side window and I could put this control stand in there and you can run a train around the railroad. And then uh, the air, air conditioning unit that was overhead, uh, which is one of the air conditioning units for my shop here and for the uh, crew lounge, decided to die. And when it did, I found out that I couldn't replace it with one that was similar. I had to actually have one that sat on the floor. And I said, okay, well, that wipes out the crew, the, the cab idea. Now, I still had this thing. And uh, one of my operators uh, named Bob Bucklew, well, Bob came down one time and he said, let's see if we can get this thing working. So we hooked up a couple of sections of track to it. And, you know, and we actually got it where I ran a, remember it was a uh, Atlas C420. And we actually ran it back and forth on this piece of track and you could blow the horn. I said, this is cool. So now I said, where am I going to put this thing now? I said, well. When I built this, I have a, I had a five stall uh, garage on the lower floor of the barn. Now, stall number one is where the dispatchers are, and I said, "Well, that's not going to work." I said, "Well, the far end, well, I can, I'll use that." Now, wait so, a minute, wait a minute. Where yeah. did, which stall was the Corvette in? 
Uh, that was in the middle one. But then eventually I actually ended up building another garage out back. So all the cars moved out to the out back. So, but, uh, what year so was I, the, what year was the Corvette? 66. Yeah. That's so, what I thought. Yeah. It was a cool. Yeah, car. I th- I, you still got I it? Had it I, yeah. I bought it in November, 1972 when I was still in the Navy. Wow. And, uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, I raced it. It was a street car, but I raced it in SCCA and B production for a couple of years in the middle seventies. And, uh, it's still got a lot of the stuff on it. I had it re I had it redone about 2003 and, uh, had the, had the roll bar, had a five point roll bar and it had that taken out. And I put a lot, uh, changed it more into a street car, but it's, it's got, uh, it's got a lot of race stuff still on it. It's not your normal, it's not a restored Corvette. It's far from original, but, uh, so I've owned it, you know, 50, I've owned it 51 years this last uh, January. Can so, I, can I take it for a spin? Uh, you can ride in it. You can. <laughs> 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 so, uh, it's fairly healthy. It's got an old aluminum 427. In it, so. Cool. No, it's, uh, Have you ever heard of Lex Parker? He's a narrow gauge uh, model railroader just uh, outside of Buffalo, just on the Can- Canadian side of Buffalo, uh, uh, Buffalo. Beautiful. Uh, model railroad of the silverton and drango mm-hmm. and uh have you ever heard of him no i have not okay well he had a corvette and he has corvettes all the time and he lets me drive his oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so well, maybe I'm... so maybe give him a call and then maybe maybe give you a bit more confidence oh okay all yeah. right <laughs> so anyways yeah back to the locomotive uh yeah oh so so anyway so i said okay well and I started, I said, well, I can, uh, I can actually build the whole cab or just, you know, I can build just the cab from the windshield back. And he sort of, a, a basic cab is really like an end by, t- it's eight foot by 10 foot box is what a basic, the cab dimensions are of a normal EMD cab. So I tried to find a set of plans for one, couldn't find them. And uh, I realized there's a, a local uh, little short line over here on the, called the Westchester Railroad. And they had a bunch of Alcos, but they also ended up with an ex Conrail GP38 that had been uh, used as a switcher over here at a power plant over uh, near Conshohocken. And it was called Crombie, as Doug would know that. And uh, so I, I went down and saw them and said, Hey, just, uh, you know, any chance I could measure this cab? Anyway, what do you want to do that for? I said, Well, I want to build one. And the guy said, Okay. So, you know, they opened it up. I went in there with a, you know, tape roll, a tape measure, and a bunch of other stuff. Took a whole bunch of measurements, you know, where how big the windshields were, where they were, uh, and a uh, whole bunch of pictures. Came back here and uh, designed it and basically built a cab, a uh, complete cab up from the headlights all the way up to the rear door, to actually to a little bit of the electrical box. And I also decided, well, I got the room here. I'm just going to go ahead and put a nose on it. So I built the nose, which comes off. And I put handrails on it. And uh, I had the builder's plates. I had some builder's plates at one time. And one of the builder's plates I had was for the 6206, which was a Pensy engine. <clears throat> and it was one of the ones that they had local troll in. And it was one of the, what they called the, back then, the master units. And it was the last unit that was delivered to the Pennsylvania Railroad in Pensy paint. Uh, it wasn't the last one built. But because of the loco troll, it was held back at EMD, I guess, for whatever reason. So it was the last one delivered. And I said, well, I've, I got the builder's fight for it. So it'll be the 6206. So uh, I basically sat down and built the cab. And uh, I found uh, found a guy that worked out in, in Silvis who I could buy parts off of other engines. So I got some of the electrical panels, uh, switched some of you know, the panels for the back of the, the front of the electrical cabinet. I got a headlight assembly off of a CSX GP40. I got grab irons. I got windshield wiper motors and windshield wipers. Uh, what else? I had a horn. Uh, I had a five chime horn and stuff. So uh, basically I built the thing and installed it. And Bob Bucklew, we hooked up a Windows 10 computer to it. And uh, we've run, we run a camera car around the railroad. I have an SD45 that has a camera in the nose. And uh, basically you can, you can run, you know, uh, it's not the it's not really finished. The cab's finished, but as far as the operations are not finished yet, uh, we can manually input grade into it, either up or down, and and that can that will affect how it runs through the, through the computer program. 
in the perfect world, what we would have is we'd actually have a car in there with an inclinometer in it, and it would instantly feed back stuff to the computer. So, you know, when you're rolling along on the flattened level and you hit a grade, it'll start to slow down. Um, and uh, So have you used it in an operating session yet or no? We, we, tr- we have once. Uh, but I, I, I discovered also, we discovered also that what the way, the original way I had it set up, it was actually drawing too much power and you, uh, so that that's been fixed, but we haven't, uh, we, we've run it mostly at open houses. Right. Yeah. And, and eventually you'd probably like to be able to run it. Oh yeah. 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 Do you yeah have... The idea is the conductor would be upstairs with a radio ah, okay. and it has, a, it has a radio. And so the idea is, you know, you, you know, you basically, you know, you basically, okay, yeah, it's two to a hitch and uh, it's one. Okay. That'll do. And you, you know, you know, you do what you got to do in the cab and uh, upstairs it'll run. Um, uh, Kelly, do you have an incl- inclinometer? An inclinometer? No, I don't. That's not what you said, Ken. What'd you say? Yeah. In- yeah. Something basically that would, you know, that could give inputs Wi Fi to the computer, you know, automatically. And that way the computer, could do it, you know, right, right, and say right now manually, uh, you know, Bob Bucklew can be in the back and he can say, okay, I'm going to put this in as a 2% grade. Right. And all of a sudden it starts to slow down. And just for funny, he said, all right, just try something. He says, just put the throttle back to idle and don't touch the brakes. So you put it back to idle and the thing slows down and stops. And then it starts to roll backwards all on its own. <laughs> so you put brakes on it, right? And say, okay. And you stop it. All right, and that's okay. So now you go, okay, you hit notch one and you hit notch two, and you hit a little bit more RPM, and you let off the brake, and it still tries to go backwards. And because you can also punch in manually light locomotives, light load, medium load, heavy load. So uh, the idea is heavy load, you know, maybe you got a 10,000 ton train behind. And, um, uh, uh, yeah. Like a simulator. Yeah, I get it. So, Doug, what did you, what did you, uh, what did you think uh, for your first time here on uh, the old podcast? Yeah, it's in, it's uh, fun. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, it's fun. Okay, did you have fun, Kelly? I had a great time. I was, I, I was looking for old photos that I took at the two steel modelers meet when we went to Ken's, and I can't, I only found two thousand four. You should have, you should you love steel mill modeling. You should oh, have, you I, when should I have saw, like, oh. yeah, but you should have like a thousand questions for him. Uh, I've already asked a lot of questions when I was there. You've asked like three when you no, were down there. there. When I was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've been there three times. And who and who on the podcast heard you and, ask these questions? <laughs> <laughs> the point of the podcast is it doesn't matter. I know. Do I you know. think I've ever asked a question that I haven't already asked somebody in person? No, I know you have. Yeah, you're, you're you're good. Like I've uh, numerous times I've asked Rich to stop bothering me, and he continues. To... <laughs> hey, at least I'm not pot- pocket dialing you. Yeah, there's oh, yeah. oh, oh, nice. Oh, one, yeah. oh, nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and by the way, Rich, thanks for helping me up the mountain there, up to the ledge. You were getting uh, worried. You... you were getting worried that I wasn't going to make it. Well, I did drop all my gear off and came I know. back and you, you, came were back almost, and got him? Oh, you were almost wow. to the, no he was almost to the top yeah he so, came back and all got good. Wow. yeah uh i didn't think I, for a while there i didn't think i was gonna that's a steep climb man getting up there this is where yeah, we it go, really is it this really is, is where steep. we go to photograph trains on the west side of the of the horseshoe curve um oh okay yeah yeah man what a steep you know uh uh doug this is, might be something you want to keep in mind for next year but uh Rich kind of carries me up most of the way. So maybe you want to jump in there and help him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is it. That's it. We're done. We got it. Ken, Ken, can we do another episode where we let people yeah. ask you questions? Yeah. Yeah. No problem. All right. Uh, Doug, would you like to return for another episode? Absolutely. Uh, right. Rich? Yes. All right. Kelly, uh, when we return for another episode, maybe you could bring your Rapido trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. If it's N, if it's H O, the fast track is Rapido. Well, there you go. See that way. Why, why can you do it sometimes and you can't do it other times? <laughs> is that an, is that automatic? 
It's supposed to be, yeah. It's supposed to be. But yeah, I, if I say Rapido Trains? No, nope, doesn't work that way. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I found that out the hard way. <laughs> uh, and Kelly, can you give out our email address? Yes, I can give out our email address. You can reach us through the wonders of email at modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modeler with one L like Conrail, not two L's like Rockville. Wow, nice one. Yeah, I'm getting good at that. Well, let's not get carried away. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want my head to start swelling. That's yeah. true. <laughs> it was a very good effort. That was a very good effort. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And if you didn't catch the email address, if you go to our website, amodelerslife.com, and you just scroll down there a little bit, you'll see a picture of the moderately agitated male boy in a particularly agitated state. And all you got to do is click on that picture and boom, the email address is already made. And all you got to do is fill in your text and send us the email. Because we love to get email, positive or negative. We like to get email. We read them all on the air. And email's fun because people have all kinds of things to say. And it's always interesting. Um, do you like the viewer, the viewer mail shows, Rich? Absolutely. Yeah, I know. They're good. That's how we met Uncle Dave. That's how we met you. Was from viewer mail. Yep. Although what I later discovered is you're not that interesting. Uh, I thought that was pretty clear right from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says to me, Doug. The first time I ever wanted to interview him, he goes, well, I'm not that interesting. And I went, well, I know I've met you, but I still want to interview you. <laughs> well, I mean, to, in fairness, it was after you had interviewed Uncle Dave yeah. for the first time. And let's face it, compared to Uncle Dave, you know. I'm not very interesting. That's so. like following a banjo player at a county fair. You know, that's a tough <laughs> act to follow <laughs> for anybody. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Ken, have you ever... Oh, Doug, have you ever wanted a shirt with a hot dog on it? Have I ever wanted a shirt with a hot dog on it? I asked you first. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> yeah, you answer it. <laughs> that that's not the worst idea you've ever had. Oh, okay. oh. oh. wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> Somebody was prepared. prepared. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Well, Doug, if you ever decide that you do want a shirt with a hot dog on it, if you go to Midwest Model Railroad, and their URL is MidwestModelRR.com, and you go to uh, scroll across the navigation bar to other. And click on that, and in the drop-down menu, you'll see AML Shop. And in there, you will, boom, you will find a wonderland of AML merchandise. Hats, hoodies, mugs, T-shirts. And in there, you'll find a T-shirt with a hot dog on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you ever want one, you'll be all set to go. And, cool. Doug, if you like this podcast, and you'd like to hear, your, uh, hear more podcasts, twice as much podcasting every week, if you click on our link for Patreon uh, for just a few cents a day, or $5 a month. You can get twice as much podcasting. The Monday show is free, and the Tuesday show costs you $5 a month. And with that money, that's the money we use to rent RDCs and buses and all that kind of stuff, and pay for hamburgers and all that sort of stuff. So that's uh, that's our other, so then you would get like two podcasts a week. Sometimes you'd have to listen to Kelly twice a week. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Which can be... It can wear you down, but it's well worth it yep. in the end. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to take you to wing nuts. Uh, Ken, we, someday we got to figure out how to get you to actual Buffalo and take you to wing nuts. Yeah. One of these days, I, I, it's funny. I want to get up to Rochester. You mentioned you know, Otto Vondrak in the, the museum up there. They have a, a Pensy N5C cabin car up there that I sold to them many years ago. So uh, I actually owned a caboose at one time, too. Oh, jeez. So, of, no, oh. yeah. of course you did. Of course you did. Now, uh, when you said you ha you started out in N-Scale with your home layout in the townhouse, did you yeah. just, did you re discover, like we did, that N-Scale is like a bad Wi-Fi signal? Sometimes it runs really well and other times not so much. Yeah, that, that was the issue. <laughs> that was... Uh, or it, ran it, well backwards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, con remember the Concord PAs were great. Uh, the turbines ran, U50s ran great, things like that. But if you wanted to run the Atlas GP30s or GP9s, 
sometimes they would run and sometimes they wouldn't. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, really hard to get a good running and scale roster at that point in time. Yeah, so. and, and as opposed to today where the, the stuff is just absolutely spectacular. Oh, it is. It is amazing. It is. It is. Truly so. is. Um, I think, uh, Kelly, have we covered everything? Yep. I think did so. I, yeah. Did I wake you up? No, no. I'm just thinking okay. of, you, you covered everything. I don't want to. Let's ask, let's, let's ask Rich. She's, he listens to all of them. He's a, yeah. he's becoming a veteran of the podcast, the AML Nation podcast. Uh, Rich, do you feel like we've covered everything? So I'm going to admit, I know we briefly talked about mail, but we did we talk about the button on the webpage for to send mail? Yeah. He okay. did do that. He yeah, did yeah, do Uncle that. Dave. Yeah, and also if you if you like Patreon stuff and you want to see more of Uncle Dave, there's a there's a place there. You just click on the button oh, yeah. and you go to his Patreon channel, yep. which is really cool. I like making Dave make videos. It's fun to watch him make videos. Mm. And then when I get the video, I make I stop it, and so he's making funny faces. <laughs> 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 I mean, truly, every time you mention Conrail, every time you mention Doug Watts and the fact that he worked for Conrail. He really, literally, he actually starts to get sweaty and he gets so excited. <laughs> He's like a puppy dog. <laughs> he starts running, starts running around in circles and like, <laughs> Conrad, Doug worked for Conrad. Doug worked for Conrad. Uh, uh, God. I think Dave is, Dave is very, very proud that there are several, Doug being one of the more regular, ex-cons, as they call themselves, mm -hmm. who, who really uh, enjoy participating with the, the OC. That is a very good point, Rich. Thank you for that. That you're absolutely 100% right. Dave is very proud of the fact that uh, the guys, the ex-cons, the Conrail, ex-Conrail guys enjoy operating his Onondaga cutoff, which is representation of the High Line around Syracuse, uh, New York. And he has a license for, to, uh, for and Conrail. He has a, and he yeah. may be the only... You, I think he, he's the only one. I think he may be the only model railroad in the entire world that has a license from that from an actual railroad to sell their to sell stuff with their logo on it. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> what yep. a guy! What yep. a guy! Yeah. Um, man, Rich and and Doug, you got to get Dave down to operate. I got to go down and operate Ken's. Um, yeah, that's, on what, down. that's what I want to do. I want to operate the helpers on the man. That would be such oh. a cool job. Um, and now Ken's getting all, now Ken's getting all sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't let him back up. That's, yeah, it. that's right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, are you, are you ready, Ken? We're going to do it one more time, at least one more time, probably one more time to let uh, people ask you questions from the AML nation. Are you good with that? Yep. No right. problem. All right. So are you, so now Ken, at the appropriate moment, you have to say happy rails to you. Do you think now there's no dancing, there's no interpretation, there's no singing. It's just simply happy rails to you. Do you think he can handle that? I think I can do that. All right. Well, Ken, as we close the barn doors in another episode and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say happy rails to you. Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumber Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.